Oh, the lighting shouldn't be a problem. Why don't you sit over here? Start again with the story of Fullen Camp and what that means. Well, the Fullen Camps, everything has a beginning, and none of us can go back to Adam and Eve, although we really do. But uh, it's very difficult to figure out where these names come from, although most of them have come from the fact that our ancestors, for the most part, were peasants and serfs. Mm -hmm. And um, they had their trades, or they occupied, or had a piece of land, and they took the name from that. And land was the all-important thing. I'm going to digress here for just a moment. Land was so important that as the families grew, and there were big families for the most part, the land kept on being divided and divided and divided to the point where there was just no land to go around anymore. And this was the thing that really brought the Fulham camps over here because they had no standing or prestige whatsoever unless they had land. land. And so, so it was not military prescription or religious persecution or anything of that sort that brought them over, but they were willing to undergo all of these hardships because they were told that they could be owners of land here in, the, in, in America. Mm -hmm. So, the first that we know about any Fulham camps over there is a certain laborer, and uh, as far as we can tell, the origins were in the vicinity of Osnabrück, uh, of which uh, province Ancum is a part. And is Ancum a city? Ancum is just a small town. At mm -hmm. one time it numbered up to seven some thousand, mm -hmm. but now it's around two thousand. And um, the lands went through so many different kinds of rulership and, and uh, dominion. Uh, for a time it was in the hands, of course, just the Saxon peasants. And then it was in the hands of the uh, monasteries back in the 15th and 16th century. Then it went into the hands of, as the church became stronger, the bishop of the district became the... the uh, Catholic church? The, yes, the Catholic church became the sort of the ruler. This mm -hmm. is the way the state set it up. And then, of course, as the Protestantism came in, and got very, very strong, and they, as a matter of fact, the Swedish Protestants and others, the Lutherans, invaded that part of Germany. Sometimes the people would kind of swing from side to side mm -hmm. in anything just to save their hides. Sure. But the area around Ankum remained Catholic for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so it was out of this setting that our ancestors came. What year was that, you think? Well, uh, I, I'm going to have to say roughly around the late 1700s, close to 1800s. That's mm -hmm. where they, we first pick it up. Herman? Well, the Herman, but the records seem to indicate more that his name was Henry. Henry. Henrik or Henrik. Heinrich. Heinrich? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, from this setting, I came Henry Fonkamp, who was married, and of course it was very, very difficult for them to even eke out an existence, and they would have to go off to the peat bog places, go a thousand miles away, it would take them three, four weeks to make that journey, just to try to keep body and soul together. Where, where would they have to go for a thousand miles? They would go into Poland, some went as far as Russia. To find work? To find work, yes. Rur, rur. So anyway, Cold. it was it was out of this setting that this Heinrich von Gant, or some said Hermann, but it's more likely it was Henry, came with his wife and three children mm -hmm. to the United States in 1834, mm -hmm. and they sailed on the Cassander out of Bremerhaven and arrived in Baltimore, and from Baltimore made their way across land by horse or just plain walking. Uh, usually they had a, a few funds together and they would kind of work from place to place 
to get this or to get that, to buy a horse or to buy a wagon. And they made their way to the Ohio River mm -hmm. across Pennsylvania. And when they got to the Ohio River, they took a boat down to Cincinnati. There again, it was a question of being take, kind of uh, harbored by other German families who had preceded them there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, having stayed there for about two years and getting some funds together, Nicholas, the oldest son who was now, the ages vary anywhere from 13 to 18 mm -hmm. that he was, and he's the man that we're going to deal with the most, Nicholas, the Nicholas? son of Henry. Uh, what were the other two children's names? Well, we'll, we'll get to we'll come to that okay. in a moment. Nicholas uh, was the one that we're going to deal with mostly, and he was around, around 18, more likely around 18, 18, when they came from Germany, and then he got a job working at, at the, on the Miami Erie Canal, which at that time was being built from Cincinnati up to Dayton. Mm -hmm. And this was how practically all the German immigrants got work of some kind, many of them on this canal, in order to have a few dollars together to be able to survive through the winter and to also to uh, get started up here and to buy some land, which they would buy for a dollar or a dollar twenty an acre. But this, at this point in time, Henry's still in uh, Cincinnati, though, right? In Cincinnati, all right. Yes. And so it was approximately two years after their arrival in Cincinnati in 1834 that they then arrived up here around 1836. And Father Dominic Gerlach, who investigated this pretty closely, uh, checked the Ohio census records and there is no record of any, any Henry phone camp or Herman phone camp until 1836. The same thing with the church records. However, in 1836, there's definite proof that they were here because Catherine, the sister of Nicholas, she was the second one, the girl, mm -hmm. was, uh, I'm sorry, Catherine, the mother, Henry's wife, Nicholas's mother, mm -hmm. was godmother for some child at a baptism in Minster. In Minster? In Minster. I'd like to interrupt at this particular point to say that all the historical records that we can find, and in Cincinnati it's very vague because of their uncertain staying there, mm -hmm. but uh, the, de the records begin to take shape in Minster and mostly here at St. John's and Marty Stein. Mm -hmm. Baptisms, marriages, and funerals. Well, deaths. let me interrupt just a second. Whose yes. whose grave do we go see in Maria Stein Cemetery? That's uh, my grandpa. Your grandpa, Henry Paul. Henry. Henry. So we're going to get to him. Yeah. Oh yes. We'll okay. Come to him. All right. Now you asked before. Great grandpa. Who okay. were the children of Henry? There were Nicholas the oldest, mm -hmm. and then Catherine, and then Henry. Mm -hmm. And Henry, of course, as if he was just a little boy, came up with the family, but he went back to Cincinnati afterwards and got into the tailoring business. And uh, as far as we know, there are no descendants of Henry down there. In Cincinnati? In Cincinnati. Yeah. You know, that branch has died out. Catherine was married to a Bertke, okay. and that's how we're tied into the Bertkes. Nicholas married Mary Adeline or Adelaide or Adelaide von der Haar. Von der Haar? Yes, here, and she also came from Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know the exact age of Nicholas because uh, when he got married, because it depends on much on how old he was when he. Right. But anyway, as far as I can figure, the uh, his marriage date must have been around 1844 or 1845. Okay. And uh, now we have on this paper that, of course, you can talk about some other time. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the uh, record of, uh, of uh, Nicholas's children. I wasn't able to find that picture, by the way, you know, and, mm -hmm. but I have it. I'll, we'll get around to it. Yeah. Well, but, Jimmy's going to have all this documentation, right? Yes, so Jimmy right. will have a lot of but stuff. But Henry was the oldest boy. Now, there was a Catherine who was the oldest of uh, 
Nicholas's children. All right, Nicholas, this Henry, is this our grandfather? No, no. That was the other Henry, our grandfather. Different Henry. He was the oldest of the boys. We're not up to that yet. There was only one, <laughs> not there. There was only one child ahead of him, and that was Catherine. Catherine. And uh, she was married to this Henry Burke, as I said. <coughs> now, I'd like to say just a moment before we get into more of here in the United States mm -hmm. about the description of the older Henry Follenkamp as described in the exit paper uh, of Germany. And we wonder where we all of us get our height. We didn't get it from that part because he was five feet seven inches tall. <laughs> I think we got it more from the streaker side. The in, side. In a yeah. Speaker and a poster tall. He was a stocky build, mm -hmm. high forehead, blonde eyebrows, dark blue eyes, uh -huh. large nose, <laughs> normal mouth, poor teeth, Four teeth. Brown chin, brown beard, so it seems that his hair were kind of brown. Uh, mm -hmm. an oval face, and a healthy skin color. Now, since we're going to zero in here, uh, Henry, as I said, was the oldest of Nicholas's boys. Mm -hmm. Then Nicholas settled the farm that we referred to as the original phone camp place. Uh, where is that? That is on 119, as you go east out of St. John's, Mariestein, right after you cross the county line to Auglaes County, the first farm on the right, where presently Toby's lives. Mm -hmm. Later on, Nicholas and son St. John. This St. John. No, St. John, Ryan Stein with it. Nice Morris hall is. Okay. Okay. Nice hall is. Okay. Nice hall is. Then, then as you go through, the, you'll come to a little crossroad. That's at the edge of town. But a half mile further past the Hellscat place is the county line. County line road. Okay. County, line road. Okay. county line road. Then you keep on 119, the first house on the right. First farm on the right. The way up there is three, three big silos. Yeah. First farm on the right. It's off of 119 itself, man. It's off of 119. Yeah, itself. the lane goes off of 119. First farm on the right. I know where the county line road is. First farm on the right. Right. Okay. And what is interesting about that phone camp farm being right across the county line, right on this side, on the Mercy County side, on the right side, is the Hills Camp place. So you see, grand, great grandpa phone camp, Henry phone camp, didn't have far to go to court his girl. He married Mary Hills Camp for the next farm. <laughs> well, that's the way it was yeah. pretty much in the old days. Well, keep in mind as we go through this, how many generations lived on that farm? While you're resting a little bit here, let me tell you something I found interesting when I was in Germany. Uh -huh. And I went, no, don't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I went to visit Ewald Phone Camp. Mm -hmm. Dr. Fisher took me to Ewald Phone Camp, which is out of, uh, not on home, but some other little small town. And I can't remember the name of it. Westphalia. But mm -hmm. anyway, uh, the phone camp farm stayed in that name where he's the word Ewald phone camp. So that farm was in that was called phone camp from way back in time, way on back from the time even before the time when the, the boys came over here. No kidding. Even before that, always stayed in phone. And the reason for it is because the farm has never changed names. It all, one of the boys always took over that farm, or part of it, and it stayed pulling camp, pulling camp. Joshua. However, then they came along a family that had no sons. Mm -hmm. So the daughter married a man by the name of Eval, Eval Rushaw. Mm -hmm. But in order for Eval Rushaw to marry this Catherine pulling camp, he had to take the name Fullencamp. Did he really? Because the farm changes. The farm name is not going to change. That's going to stay Fullencamp. It stays Fullencamp. So he became, instead of Eval Rushaw, he became Eval Fullencamp. And he is to this day Eval Fullencamp. No kid, That's interesting. I found that interesting too. I never knew well, that. His wife's name, Elizabeth, was wasn't Catherine. Yeah. Wasn't it Elizabeth? Wasn't it? I think it was Elizabeth. That really shows your respect for the land. Yeah, that's right. Boy, the, land stayed the, the land stays. People come and go, but the yeah. land stays. But there was no sun. Yeah. And this is why the people went to, they told me at that time, that, that 
these, they owned these farms for years and years and years, and every time they had sons, they would split these farms up, and you get a piece, yeah. you get a piece. piece. But finally, you couldn't split it anymore. Well, we get too small. And they had so many children, and that's when they went to the and down to the roar. Yeah. And so on, like, they yeah. recorded that. Uh, yeah, I got it all. Good. Yeah, Brian. that's the whole idea. We don't, this is not meant to be a masterpiece. This is meant for, <laughs> for all of us to enjoy in later years. All I right. never do that. Now, I'd like to tell you something else about this phone jam business. You know, our name, as he said, it goes way, way, way on back. So it seems we're older than most families can point to. Mm -hmm. It goes on back, but there was a connection with horses all the way through. That's where we got that name, Foal and Camp. Camp, yeah. Our English words, Foal and Philly, come from that Saxon word. Foal and Mm -hmm. When Gus Lipmer came to this town as a shoemaker here in St. Henry, he came from that district. And when this business came up, my dad told what he knew about the different things. He says, oh yes, he says, they've always been associated with the horse business, the Fallen Camp. Fallen Camp? Now, that doesn't seem to tie in too much with this uh, you won't. Henry. You yeah. won't. But anyway, and it seems that because of the type of horses they had, the former camps kind of split into two uh, uh, groups. Mm -hmm. The one group that raised these big farm horses, big heavy horses, you know, I guess the, uh, the Clydesdale type. Draft horses? Draft horses, and because they would haul so much lumber, logs out of the, out of the Schwarzwald, mm -hmm. the Black Forest. And, um, and the other group went in for the raising of fine horses, driving horses, and uh, racing horses. Now they both got raided. When the French would come through, this is during the Thirty Years' War, and this dates back to 1600 and something. Oh, really? They would ra raid these big draft horses, you know, they need them because that was the only means they had to haul their cannons and everything around. Yeah. And so they would get them taken away. But the other farm camps, who had these fine horses, raised them for racing and so on. They would get graded every time there was a war because they needed them for cavalry mm -hmm. and so on, you see. And this Mr. Henry Fulham Camp over in Germany told me back in 1954 that these Fulham Camps uh, with the fine racing horses went through one fortune after another. They would become very rich with this horse thing, you know. And then they would lose everything because the Bismarck, you know, came in with the war right. and took all of his horses, took all of their horses. Mm -hmm. And then when that was over with, uh, they started all over again. Then came World they War One, and, and yeah. Kaiser Wilhelm, <laughs> Kaiser Bill, he took all of the horses again. And this is the way it went on, up and down. But it seems that these people, with these fine racing horses, they would sometimes come into so much wealth that they kind of pulled away from the others or considered the others sort of beneath them or something like that. <laughs> and they pulled more over towards the Hanover area, uh -huh. the big city. Whereas the ones with the big heavy draft horses, they were staying in the Schwarzwald district and uh, they would uh, haul these big logs and they would use three, four teams to pull these big wagons. And Gus said they would come through. He says he remembers it yet as a boy. They would come through the villages at four or five o'clock in the morning, up on these big logs, driving these great big draft horses, rip roaring drunk. He said they were all heavy <laughs> whiskey drinkers. And I said, that's the outfit we've got. Yeah. Right <laughs> so anyway, I just thought I'd throw that little aside. Yeah, in that's great. It, it ties in with yeah. the name. Yeah. Uh, All right, now to come back to where we were. But, you know, but some of this stuff. We are all descendants, of course, therefore, first of Henry, then Nicholas, Nicholas. then Henry, uh, his oldest son. And, uh, and then Henry had three... This is my grandfather, your great grandfather. Okay. Had three daughters Elizabeth, who was married to Fred Bosco, Anna, who was married to Henry Dwanger, a distant relative of Bishop Dwanger, and Catherine, who was married to a, a Buddendick. 
And then the oldest of the sons, and this is important to remember because the oldest son always kind of had a first uh, lean to him getting the land, mm -hmm. was Grandpa, my dad, John. He was the oldest. He was the oldest son. And then there was Ben and there was Joe. Now, when Grandpa, or that is your great-grandfather, Henry, got married, his grandfather gave him 80 acres, and that's in the vicinity of, uh, on your road there, which we knew as a farm. Yeah. And then afterwards, Grandpa bought another 160 acres from another man, I can't remember his name, it's in that paper there. Mm -hmm. And what's also interesting, he bought 40 more acres from a Shrege estate. I know where that's at. Uh -huh. that's, uh, that's, that's north and that's south and east of uh, our farm. Yes. You got to go south. You got to go first east, and then south. When you're heading towards uh, ben, Uncle Ben's speakers, you went past the Shrigi Farm, 40 acre Shrigi Farm. That's where it's located. Well, anyway, we had this. So it seems that Henry, and according to the article taken from the Mercer County book, there, he was pretty uh, well off, you know, land wise, and he was a good farmer and so on. Now here's here's where we get into the cup. Something that might be kind of interesting. Dad was growing up, but when was he? About 18 or 19 years old when he fell off the back of a hay wagon and broke his neck. Mm -hmm. And he was virtually helpless. That's my dad, your grandpa. Paralyzed. Virtually paralyzed for about three years. Bed fast for two years. That's why, if you recall, grandpa walking always was stooped over a bit. Couldn't turn his neck. And, um, yeah. Couldn't turn his neck. Turned well, his whole shoulders now. Yeah. Yeah, now here's another interesting thing that Dad himself told me. Knowing that that he was going to get the main portion of the farm, being the oldest son, mm -hmm. he wasn't too happy about that because he wasn't that crazy about farming itself. He was interested in farms, but not that crazy about farming itself. And so he um, he got and with that broken back situation after finally healed enough that he could get around, he got the idea that he wanted to study and be a lawyer. No kidding. I heard a little bit about this and what to Definitely. Do. But you see, Dad had only five years of grade school education. And then, as the farmers did, Grandpa pulled him off out of the school and said, that's enough schooling for you. You know, you're reading and writing and arithmetic, now you work on the farm. Now, who was Grandpa then? That was Grandpa... Grandpa Hen Henry. Henry. Yeah. So... He's the one buried in Maria Stein's cemetery. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, they all are. They all are, okay. And uh, so anyway, when Grandpa heard this, that is, your great-grandpa Henry heard this, he hit the ceiling. He said he wanted his oldest son to be the farmer, to take care of that farm, and he would have none of, nothing of it. But it seems that Dad did take a kind of a flyer or two. He went down to Cincinnati. He got on that old CHD train mm -hmm. that ran through the uh, um, Chickasaw, Maria Stein, Osgood, and so on. Took it down to Cincinnati and uh, inquired, and of course he would have had to finish his what would amount to uh, high school. And by that time about, he'd be ready to be a lawyer, because it didn't demand that much at that time. Mm -hmm. But Grandpa would have nothing of it, and uh, so that's where it stayed. Well then, <clears throat> and I want to put another little aside in here. Our farm, that is uh, where we lived and what, where Grandpa Henry started the farm, on your road, was about halfway between Marnie Stein and Osgood. Well, Dad would have to get off of the train or on the train at Osgood or at Marnie Stein, which was at least two miles either way, mm -hmm. or two miles or more. So uh, there was a bit of a hill there by our farm where the train went over. The train didn't have that much power, and it would kind of chug along and all at once get about slow enough that he could hop on or hop on, off. Well, one day he came back from Cincinnati and he decided to hop off there and he missed steps some way and fell down flat face and 
of course, his whole front of his body, plus his face and arms and everything else, scraped full of cinders. And for hours, Grandma was picking the cinders out of his hide, you know. And uh, so much for that. Then uh, things went along uh, with uh, the three girls being married and out. There was just Dad, and that uh, was John and uh, Ben and Joe there at the farm. And um, so finally, when Dad was 28 years old or so, he met Mother. And they met at the cornerstone laying of the St. Rose Church back in 1910. And it happened in the following way. It was about 4, 4.30 in the afternoon, and Dad said to uh, he was playing these stands and so on, and he won one of these Cupid dolls. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, Cupid, Cupid doll. Sure. All right. So, um, of course, uh, it's like the fellows are today. They like to kind of show off in front of the girls a little bit, or uh, make themselves felt important. He tossed this Cupid doll out, and Mom caught it. She was young Gertie Streaker, only 17 years old. And anyway, she looked at Dad, and Dad thought she was pretty nice, and he says, don't go away. He says, i got to go home. I'll be back in about two hours. i got to go home and do the feeding, feed the stock. So he got in his horse and buggy, went there, and he came back afterwards, Mom said. And uh, that's where the romance started, back there in 1910. Right. At St. Rose. Oh, Mother pointed that out time after time after time. This is where we met. It was at the Cornerstone Lake. Oh, that church is there now. And so, uh, as the, uh, the romance developed very quickly, and Grandpa Streaker approved to John. He thought he was a good, solid man, had a good farm, and, and uh, very sensible. Of course, he was 28 years old already. They arranged to get married, and they got married at St. Nicholas Church in Osgood, Ohio on October the 11th, 1960, uh, 1911. 1911. October the 11th, 1911. Mm -hmm. Now where were they living at the time? Well, then they lived right there at that farm. The same one, right over the, right in the Albany County line. Right was born. Yes. There's an old house on And it. Ben and Joe. Yeah. There's an old house. That wasn't that new house. Dad built that after he was married. I'll tell about the old house in a minute here. Mm -hmm. they, they lived there, and of course Ben and Joe were still there, and Mother said, here she is a young 18-year-old bride, and all at once she's surrounded with all these men to cook for and everything like that, so she had her work cut out for her. Grandpa was a streaker, I mean, Grandpa Fulham Camp Henry, he was there part of the time, but he would also go over to some of his other children part of the time. And uh, the story goes that, uh, and this has to be mentioned too, because you just don't tell all the pretty little things, but... Uh, Grandpa Fulham Camp Henry, he liked his schnapps. And uh, every time he would go out, Mom and Dad both told me that he'd come back, he'd be loaded. And he didn't know what he was doing sometimes, but the horse always knew the way home. <laughs> so he went right on back to the farm. And uh, so anyway, they lived in the same house, which was a log house. It's right back of the present house, the house, the brick house that's there now. They lived there for several years, and both myself and Ray, my brother, were born in that house. The old log house. The old log house. And the old log house, what year were you born, Ray? Uh, 17. 17, well, I was born in The old log house, they began to tear that down around 1915. Uh, after the new house was completed. Yes, yes. Uh, That's when they did it. Yeah, yeah around 1915, 16. Yeah. I can still remember a little bit of that. And I remember an old fiddle that was hanging on the wall. I remember the spinning wheel. Some of that, all that stuff they just threw on a big general fire. They want to get rid of it. Today you can get a fortune for all of that stuff. Anyway, the old log house was was then uh, torn down after the new house, which is presently the Bergman house there on your road, was built. Dad built that. And Irene 
and your dad, Lewis, were born in that new house. In that new house. And uh, down the road a mile east was the put-off school, a typical country school of that era. And uh, in that school were all eight grades. Dad went to that school, and I went to that school from only September of 18 to March of 19, when in 1919 in March, we moved to St. Henry. And the reason for our moving was the following. Remember Dad's bad back from being broken, and it never got strong again. But he had an excellent hard hand, an excellent hand. This man just simply took over, and he practically ran the whole farm. His name was Gus Bruns. He was like a family member. Well, along came World War I, and the draft took place, and Gus had to go in because he was not a member of the family. Had he been a member of the family, because of being a farmer, he could have stayed there, but he couldn't. So he had to uh, go into the draft. Well, when Dad was presented with that situation, he tried some young fellow by the name of Bernard Schaefer, Scaffus Benny, they called him yeah. in old German, and, uh, but the boy was only 16 and he simply couldn't replace Gus in any way. So that's when Dad made up his mind to sell the farm. And so it was in the beginning of uh, 1919 that Dad sold the farm to George Bergman. Mm -hmm. And then, we, as I said, we moved to St. Henry. So I went to the little country schoolhouse mm -hmm. for those few months. And that was great. I was the only boy in the first grade, and there were three girls. Mm -hmm. There you go. Later became known as Put Off University. <laughs> <laughs> Affectionately. University of Put Off. Huh? Yeah. You ever hear that story? When I went to yeah, tell father tell a story. Did you ever hear that story about? No. Father? Well, as I told you, I went to that country school, and my dad did too. Uh -huh. Well, this is many, many years later on when they were in the. Um, beer business, a couple of these big shots from Buda Paul and Wiedemann I came around and they were sitting around talking and in the office there at the beer business in St. Henry. And uh, one of the men said, John, you seem to be pretty well educated. Where did you go to school? And Dad, without batting an eye, and took a puff on his cigar, and he says, put off university. And they said, put off university? Where in God's name is put off university? Dad says, come on, I'll show you. He took him in the car and drove him over to that old country schoolhouse. <laughs> <laughs> it's still standing, that old schoolhouse. Oh, yeah. What did his parents think? Yeah, Vince Bone can't talk in there for years. Now, can you interrupt? Yeah, yeah. I'm on now. Well, there was plenty of water, too. It rained all the way and all down and all the way back from church in a buggy. Did it? Of course, I didn't come. Yeah. You remember that, huh? I remember. <laughs> I don't remember a thing of the farm. No, I know what I was talking about. You didn't remember anything on the farm? Well, what is the first recollection you have then, moving into town? I don't even remember the Sycamore place. I remember the slave, we call it the Slagle place. Because we were only there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember on Main Street with the, with the brick house, and I fell off of the fence. The airplane went through, and everybody runs the airplane, and we were having a play, and they had a yeah. coat on me backwards, see, that. buttoned it back. <laughs> <laughs> and I across that fence and fell off and bust my head. I still got a big scar on my head. I've seen that. Yeah, I know yeah, that's a scar. How old were you then? Four years old. And then how old were you when you, you moved into the current house? You said you lived there for six years. I was four years. I was still four because we only lived in a very short time. Tiny was born in that. Esther Worm's house. Esther Worm's house. That's probably three years old. At the, uh, well, let me yeah. pick that up so you get this here. Okay, I'm with you. Yeah, oh, are you still taking it? Yeah, I'm taking it. Oh, all right. So when we moved over in March of 1919, we moved in what we call the Antrop House, and that's the last place on the east side of Sycamore Street, that is presently. South End. It's at the corner of Sycamore Street and the street that goes down to the cemetery. Okay. And we lived there about, I don't know, don't hold me to the time, it was about a year and a half, I think. Mm -hmm. At that time, I almost died of diphtheria. Rosalba was born there. Rosalma was oh. born there in that house. Mm -hmm. Then, see, Dad was trying to find a, a place that he could permanently live, and he wanted to build, but financially he just couldn't quite cut the butter. Well, what was Grandpa doing then? He was off the farm. Let, well, let me get you okay. the, the shape. 
So Dad was going to work in the spreader works. That's the new idea, mm -hmm. Michael. And he got there, and he couldn't cut the butter. He was there only a few weeks, and um, yeah. <laughs> work was too hard. Work was too hard. Well, now not only the work, but being on that concrete floor all the time. And see, he was used to being on ground. That's right. So he had to give that up. And then he began to dabble around in some real estate. Mm -hmm. And then in the meantime, we moved to what we call the Brick House on Main Street, where presently the KFC Hall is, where we had the dinner the other night. Now, that was the, when I was growing up, that was the old Harding place. Well, Frank Harding owned it, but yeah. we just rented it. You rented it from it? Okay. That's right. And we lived there only about a year. Uh -huh. Then we moved to what where Esther Worms lives now. Right. And we lived there about a year and a half, and Tiny was Tiny born was there. there yeah. Tiny was born there? In the meantime, they, Uncle Joe and Dad were building the house that your dad, where you kids grew up. And, uh... I remember that. So... I remember we kids got so Ray and I got such a big kick out of it, just being able to sleep over in that attic there before the house was even half finished. You know, the idea of sleeping in that new house, we were way up there in the attic. But um, so it was roughly around. You have a shirt like this, do you? Hold it a minute. I can click it off. That's all right. Look her up. We got lots of tape here. I can tell you just about when that was. Tiny was born 1922. He was born there. So this was, it was around the end of 1922 or the beginning of 1923 that we moved into that new house there. New house. So I was only That's three. interesting years. about that house. I was three. Okay. Uncle Joe, Dad's brother, mm -hmm. bought the old hotel down at the end the West End, next to what was uh, the restaurant down there. That's right. There was a big hotel there at that mm -hmm. time. There was a livery stable and all that. Salesmen would come through and that was a hotel. Mm -hmm. Well, as the cars came in, this uh, hotel didn't have near the use that it had before. And the passenger train service was going down too. And so Uncle Joe bought that hotel and they tore it down. And I remember working very, very hard on that. Old Dad would say, pull some more nails, pull some more nails. Today, all that stuff is just thrown away and it's burned or just mm -hmm. thrown into the rubbish and trash. Those mm -hmm. days, we saved every screw, every nail. We had to straighten them out. I, for days and days and days, I had a brick there and I would straighten these nails out, you know, so we could be used them over again. And um, much of the lumber, in fact, I would say most of the lumber in that house where you guys grew up is from that old hotel. And they had a lot of soft pine in there. And I'll never forget that banister going upstairs. I think I yep. told you about this, that when I got my first pocket knife, I was about 10 years old or so. I was pestering and pestering and pestering to get a pocket knife. And I was looking for things to try it on. So one day, I just that soft pine is just so nice, and I took a nice chip out of that, out of that banister there. Well, Dad noticed it, of course, right away. So who cut the batter? Don't know. And he asked me whether I did it, and I denied it. I lied. Mm, you you and St. Peter. You got that on record? I got it on file. All right. And then uh, finally he got it out of me, and, of course, I had to give up my pocket knife. And he didn't give it back to me for about a year or two. Yeah. I guess he was going to teach me a lesson. Fair is fair. So anyway, that's where the place was. And uh, as I say, that by that time, I guess I was about uh, 10 years old mm -hmm. and uh, 11 years old. And uh, two years later, I went away to Burgersville. And really and truly, I missed the growing up of my family. That's the only thing I yeah. regret. Now, we got some of our priests who were younger members of the family, they grew up with their family. Grew up with see? their family, yeah. But I didn't, and that's why I know so little about what, for instance, your dad and the rest of them did in the mm -hmm. process of growing up, because I wasn't around. I left home from the eighth grade when I was 13 years old. Yeah, but you didn't go far. You only went three miles, right? 
four miles. Four miles. The, to the Burkittsville Novitiate. Burkittsville Novitiate. But let's stop right there, cut it off. Mm. From Novitiate on September the 8th, 1926. Mm -hmm. And I was there one year. And I went to St. Joseph's College where we finished our high school. Was that in Rensselaer? Rensselaer, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we finished our high school and also our two years of college. Mm -hmm. Of course, I added an extra year because I was sick of full year in there. Yeah. With all kinds of bleeding. Well, back up just a second. Do you know when uh, Grandpa Folding Camp started the, the beer storage? Uh, just a minute. Okay. I wanted to say something else because this should be a matter of record too. Mm -hmm. When Dad had sold the farm uh -huh. in 1919, he had a lot of money because the farm brought in, for those days, a lot of money. And around Wendelene, where your mother's area comes and so on, they were hitting oil wells. Right. There was a lot of natural gas out there, too. Natural gas. And Dad got together with a fellow by the name of John Lauer. Louie can carry some of this through. And they decided they were going to go into wells. And Dad's practically all of his money was expended into three or four wells they dug for and came up dry. Oh, my Lord. So this was why he was forced then to go into other things. And through this whole process, Dad went through several things. He dabbled around in some real estate. Then he got into, he even bought California grapes and thought he would go into the wine situation with a Hungarian okay. fellow from Minster. And, uh, well, with the prohibition agents and everything going on at that time, this is back in the 20s, it was very rough going. And then Dad went into the Watkins business. The Watkins business? Watkins, uh, Watkins products, products that they sold house to house. And he did very, very well in that. But the only problem was, as the depression was coming on, a lot of people did not pay their bills. Hmm. And to this very day, even though Dad has been gone a long time, those people, of course, have forgotten about it. But my brother Ray told me that at one time that he had about eight thousand some dollars, which of course in those days was like a lot eighty thousand a day. Right. Oh, more than that. Still more than that. owed to dad that was never paid to him. No kidding. So you see, he really had a tough man. boy. And because of this, and carrying these heavy satchels, again we come back to this back business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Week back. Well, then he finally got into the car business. And he sold used cars, and then he picked up the Chrysler line. Mm -hmm. And then at the time that he picked up the Chrysler line, the Plymouth, the first Plymouth came out. And he sold a few of those. And I remember when he sold a big Chrysler to Elizabeth Romer, who was cashier in the bank here. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did very well on that until the full effect of the Depression hit. Everybody lost their jobs all the way around, and uh, people began to sell their cars. Well, of course, that knocked out the car business because there was nobody to, who had the money to buy a car or anything. And so he had to get out of something. And so he looked around and uh, bought the uh, rights to sell the soft drinks out of Minster, which John Tolley had here and now. The Star and Beverage see, Company it. that I used to pr produce I wooden shoe beer, and he uh, took that, plus their ice business. The Mr. Brewery had a pond over here called the Brewery Pond that was ex immediately east of the canning factory. That's the old Brewery Pond. That's right. And they made ice out of that every year, and started in the ice house that they had there. And uh, then they would uh, deliver the ice out to homes, you know, 1,500 pound pieces and so on. Now into this whole era, your dad could probably tell you much more about this than I can, because I go and go by here say I was already away from home, you see. And then, but having this ice business and the soft drink business, finally Mr. Burry came up with what they call these Calvinator 
which froze fresh water ice. They didn't have to depend on pond ice anymore. In these big uh, blocks, brine tanks, brine tanks, brine tanks. Brine tanks. Brine tanks. yes, and um, well, people were just thrilled about this because they could use that ice in their drinking water, you know. Whereas the old brewery pond, there is snakes and tadpoles and everything else frozen and into it. Eh? Kids swimming in it and everything else, you know. Uh, they couldn't use that very well for drinking. Well, anyway, having that business with the Minster Brewery and this would. I'm going to put a time slot on this. This was roughly around 28. Because 28, Dad was still in the car business, but it was 28 to 29. 30. 30. Then he went in, was it 1930? 1930. Then he no. got in touch with the state of Ohio through Salina, the, the state heavy garage there. And he got the contract for one summer to mow all the weeds on the state highway in Mercer County. But she did. Having that contract, and we mowed the, had to cut all the brush along the roads, along the highways, and also mow the weeds. And had somebody hired, I don't know who did that was on the mower to mow the weeds, but Ray and I cut a lot of brush. A lot of brush. <laughs> and uh, that summer. And then uh, the summer, as the summer ended towards fall, uh, there was no more weeds to cut, no more brush to cut, and Dad was also looking to try to find something whereby he could make use of his boys. He had Ray and Louie coming up, and mm -hmm. Ryan and Red were very small and yet. Mm -hmm. So that's when he got, went over to Minster and got in touch with them to see if he could haul this ice. Because he already had a little truck to haul brush and so on like that. Mm -hmm. We used this same truck then to haul ice. We were hauling ice from the brewery pond. Yeah. And then later on in Minster, we used the same truck. For Where ice. would they store that ice in the wintertime? You know, a large insulated building. The insulation of the building was sawdust. It was right there at the brewery pond. Right there at the brewery pond. Yeah. And they would, uh, everybody would get together in the wintertime and they would uh, block after block and they used John Henry's mules to pull the ice up into the building no on a slip of skid. And you can never decide when to cut it. You try to decide should you wait or should you take it? Well, you we we got to about five or six inches, you know, you get pretty itchy. You thought, boy, is it going to get any quicker? Could I interrupt just a moment? Sure. Uh, the, the ice that he's talking about, they put in these storage things, that was uh, out of the pond. That's right. Yeah. Because when they started to get the ice afterwards from the brewery, they got it directly and hauled it out, didn't they? That's right. Yes. Yeah. That's right. That was never stored, you see. I see. When we so, started doing that, we no longer got any more ice off of the pond. That was the end of the pond. No, diamonds are first. Now, okay. then, then when the beer came back, and Louie helped me out, it came back in 32, 33. 33. 33. April 33. Since Dad was carrying, delivering ice out of the, Dad and the boys were delivering ice out of the Minster Brewery, and he was also handling the soft drinks, the star beverages out of Minster Brewery, they gave him the right to deliver wooden shoe beer, and that's how we got started in the no beer kids. business. Wooden shoe, was that out of Minster? For about the first six months to a year, he uh, hauled beer as as a uh, salesman for the wooden shoe brewery, delivered their product around. So then he got his own license, and when he got his own license, then he could handle any kind of beer, and of course, People in this were very opposed to that because they don't even want to handle that one brand. But yeah. Then he started getting other brands. And he was one of the original members of the Wholesale Beer Association of the state of Ohio. Our dad was. My dad was. So when did he start delivering beer then? What year was that? 1933. And it was Wooden Shoe Beer? Wooden Shoe Beer. And then what beer did he go to after that? Oh, we had Vipers, we had Jackson. Yeah. And it wasn't until about uh, always Fifers and Jackson, which came out of, and we had the renters out of Youngstown. Yeah. We were all that stuff, and the trucks would break down, flat tires. We had Old Dutch from Finley. Yeah. That those kind of brands. Yeah. So 1937, then he got Hootapole, uh, and he got Wiedemann's, both out of Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Same time. Yeah. And later on in that same year, he got Budweiser, which was very little, but it was high price compared to the compared local Compared to the beer. local beers, yeah. Then Wooden Shoe took the franchise away from Dad. And because he was selling so much of that other stuff, wasn't selling enough wooden shoe. And so then he went on his own on these other brands, see? Yeah. And we carried that, uh, 
those beautiful Budweiser and Wiedemann until 1945 or six when he sold out to the Suns. No. How did he Sons keep delivering Rams. beer all during the war? Well, he had his crew down. He could, anybody he could get farmers came in and helped, like Joe oh. Teeman, mm -hmm. and I forget who else, some of the other farmers were, because all the sons were gone, and Ray was on the farm farming. Yeah. And uh, whoever he could get, uh, there he had different ones. Joe Teeman, I remember. And Grandpa retired, what was, year was that? He wasn't getting that much beer then, either. he? wasn't getting that much beer. Mostly it was uh, A lot of people came in and drinks? got their beer. Oh, they oh, came in and got it. They came in and got it because uh, we couldn't deliver it for one thing and couldn't get it for the second thing. So what year did Grandpa retire then? In 45. He retired. When you, all you guys got back from the war. Back the service, yeah. he re so Grandpa was retired from 45. Then I took over as manager then. And I, yeah. for all them years under uh, Mr. Craigie was our bookkeeper. And uh -huh. also uh, Mr. Gilsman later became our bookkeeper. Uh -huh. And until, I um, can't tell you just exactly what year, but it was in the 50s. Mm -hmm. In the early Somewhere in the 50s, when Ray came along, the farm was sold. I forget what year the farm was sold. Then Ray came into town, and he and met Mr. Gelsman, and they were both retired. Yeah. And then uh, Ray came in. Ray came in. And then when did Tiny and Red come in? Oh, they were in long before that. They were taking in right, right after the war. Right after the war. Right after right the war. Right well, they worked some before the war, or even before the war. Yeah, before the war, they came. They yeah, worked some. See. See. But you see, you had to be 21 to sell beer. That was the, thing. That was the rule. You could figure out about when they were 21. See, I started to sell beer immediately in 1933, but I wasn't old enough. But I delivered to uh, Lawrence Mesher and Mario Stein. And Charlie yeah. Myron and Fort Carver is where I delivered my first beer. Yeah. But I was only 16 years old. You had to have uh, a driver's license, you know. Uh, later we had to have a chauffeur's license. Right. And then I got that all right. That wasn't a problem. But then when they said you had to be 21 to sell beer, you know what happened? I got put on the pop and ice truck and stayed there until... You were demoted. I was demoted. <laughs> I stayed on the pop and ice truck until I was old enough to 21 until I could get on the Oh, that's great. Well, let me ask you this then. When You sold insurance for a while too, didn't you? That was the year before I went in the service. Yeah, when I had a double hernia. Yeah. Those big heavy kegs just broke both hernias out. Yeah. And then when I recovered from that, I went to bought an insurance agent. And I sold that for a year. Sold insurance for a year? For a year. Uh -huh. When I went in the service, I sold that insurance agency. Who'd you sell it to? I sold to Carol Stubbs at Salina. Carol? I sold that agency to Ligers at Reinstein, who still has it today. Is that the guy who Trina works for now? That's right. Isn't that funny? Right. That's great. It goes around, comes around. But uh, Ligers was big in the business before. He just took on. He just took on more accounts. Those, those accounts that I had. So. Yeah. Well, See, now that's Emily. We're going to get her on record, too, there, right there. Yeah. That contract, that contract from yeah. when she sold it to me, Henry dug it out one time. I'm going to tell you a little story here. Yeah. All right. Yeah, this, I think this is some of the stuff that you wanted to hear anyway. I want to hear all these stories. Yeah, uh, about the brewery pond. Uh huh. That's the place where we used to go swimming. And I could stand up, but it would only go up to about my neck, you know, and I was uh -huh. about, uh, 11, 12 years old. The thing was usually muddy. It was clear when we went into it, but as soon as we thrashed around in it for a while, it was all muddy. Well, we would always go in there as God made us, you know. Nothing sans bathing suits. Now, I, at that time, was a brewery pond the edge of town? Yes, that's right. Yeah. That was that and uh, Mother would say, now you got to wear something. She says, don't be going out there naked swimming. And I said, yeah, Mom. And she would give us an old pair of pants, each one of us. And we'd go down there, and we'd get our swimming in, and then before we left, we would dip the pants into the water. <laughs> Come on home, you know. Dad, one time, he picked up the pants. He says, they're wet all right, but he says, I don't think they swam in them. <laughs> <laughs> he knew that, didn't he? What well, year did Grandpa Foley can't move into that house over there? What house? The one he's on Main Street, by John <laughs> Street. Yeah, well, that's... All right, uh, I was three years old. It had 26 years. So I moved in 1920. 1920. 1920, where the KSC Hall is. No, 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 he's talking about the brick house. The brick house. When did he move into the brick house? What brick house? On John Street, where he died. Oh, that one 1946. Here. 1946. 46. Yep, he I moved to town for October 46. Now, did, yeah. is that when you bought it from Grandpa, our, our house? Or did somebody else live in there in between? And 
What's that? Did somebody live in, in the Fulling Camp house in between there, or did you buy it from Grandpa? I bought it from Grandpa. You bought it from yeah, Grandpa. Nobody, no, nobody with Fulling Camp ever lived in that right. house. Right. Yeah. So Grandpa lived in it from 46 to when he died in 1970. What Seven, was it? 1970. 1970. 70. 70. All right. Yeah, now, I remember the grape arbor out there. 24 and years he lived in there. He was retired for 24 years. 26 years, yeah, okay. That's a long time. Yeah. He had the grape arbor in the back and the cherry trees on the side. Oh, yeah. The cherry trees, the last one died. The last one died. still producing. Yeah, but the cherry tree, last yeah. cherry tree died this year. Yeah, that's right. Dried the drought. Did it? The big old pear tree, that thing has been producing so heavily. Every year, I don't ever remember that yeah. thing being anything but loaded. Pears and cherries yeah. and grapes. Back to the brewery pond again. To the brewery. Got another brewery yeah, pond story. Well, okay. Anyway, one day we were out there, about 10 of us kids, there was one guy by the name of Bill Bamer. He was older. He was about 15 or 16. The rest of us were out 10 or 11 or 12. And we were all in there as God made us, you know. And here's some girls who drove up to that back, back road there, and they parked right on the bridge, which is right next to the pond. And they were watching us swim. And we said, go away, go away. And they wouldn't go away because they knew what state we were in. And you know, wow. after you're in the water for about <laughs> a while. half an hour, you shrivel pretty badly. And, and finally, old Bill Baber says, all oh, the hell was up. He said, <laughs> and he got up as he was. And boy, those girls took off like nobody. <laughs> right now. All right. Oh, that's great. Better cut it off. Okay. And, uh, Door open. Would hold up to 250 ton? Yeah, well, and depending on the thickness of the ice and how well they could pack it and so on like that. See, yeah. Then they had to cover all this with straw, you know, later on. Mm -hmm. Sawdust. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and after that, they, uh, Get any of those hot dogs Guy left out there? Chuck, yeah, there is. Tearing down all that. See, this thing had to constantly be raised. The first, it was flat, and the mules would pull it on a pulley. Yeah. And as they would, they would walk away, the ice would come rolling up towards the ice house. Yeah. But then it kept getting higher and higher and higher and higher and higher, and higher until you get to the top of the ice house. It was a two-story building. Yeah. 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 You're putting it way up in there. So yeah. It got pretty steep then, that ice was. Yeah. What if it fell? Huh? What is it? I would did. Fell and busted all the pieces down the side. So you just pull off the ramp and fall down the side. And fall off Piles of it was there with busted. And then Grandpa used you guys all summer long to deliver the ice into the ice box. See, every I never time, realized Grandpa was in so many different businesses. You stopped at a farmhouse. You loaded it out of the ice house just like it was. You broke it loose and loaded it in the truck. But every time you stopped at the farmhouse, you had to go out to the pump first and pump water on it to wash it or get a dipper. To get it cleaned off. Yeah, because it's uh, it's all it's all stuff. Yeah. So you can bring in a nice clean piece of ice. Yeah. See, I think that's, I never knew Grandpa was in so many different businesses. Then after the whole thing was over, then Grandpa would go out to some good friend of his out here in the country and get several gallons of whiskey. <laughs> and have one hell of a party. I mean a wing dinger. Who made the whiskey? Oh, I said, a good friend of his lived out of town here someplace. Hell, they made it all around here. Like had a still? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they had stills, yeah. See, I yeah, never chicken coops with chimneys on them. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> Years ago, there were chicken coops with chimneys. These guys that had uh, that furnaces that had them uh, stills down there. Yeah. See? Now, all during this time, Mercer County was, uh, was a fairly fertile county. They always had a lot of uh, things. Always was. Some of the best farmland in the United States. Best farmland. This is one of the poorest years in, in history. Way, we go way back. And this is going to be too terrible. bad. This is one of the very poorest years in history. No kid. Hardly ever, you'd always say, well, they always got a crop. Always got a crop. But boy, this year or something. This, this is the drought year of 88. Yeah, the heck of a time. Yeah. This is the drought year of 88. When I say they threw a party, I mean, some of those guys were thrown in the back end of the ice truck and hauled home and dumped off of their front porch. And the women would really raise, holy whatever. <laughs> Yes, sir. What, what have you done? Would he hire all this, all this hourly help right then to, to do all this? Yeah, he would some people. All the work during that period of time. All the work during that period when they were making ice. Yeah. yeah. Now, would he make ice for a month or for two months, or oh, how would he do that? Only a couple of days. A couple of days. You got to get it quick, bang, get it, get it in there. Well, he would get it off. Well, it would change. You know, uh, well, would it freeze more than one time? In a, in a winter? Sometimes it would, but you never do win. So he had to freeze as much Sometimes of it Sometimes you would take it early. Here you get about five inches, you say, boy, I better take it because I don't know what the rest of the might turn warm, we won't have it because you got to have something to sell, see? So 
You take it, then along after a while it gets colder and colder, and back in January and February it gets down and it's about a foot thick. You say, oh, why didn't I wait? But See, now, it doesn't get that cold around here anymore. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Does it get that cold around here anymore? Oh, yes, it does sometimes. Oh, well, here a couple of years, about 77, didn't we have ice? Yeah, yeah, we had... Uh, three feet thick, yeah, almost. We had, oh, we've had some cold oh, winters here. Oh, cold. oh, really? I didn't think it got that cold yeah. anymore. Oh, we've had some. I think the lake got about three feet thick already. Yeah. And, you know, ice is an insulator, too. And once you freeze down about a foot deep, it has to get very cold to make it get deeper. To get any deeper, deeper yeah, right. Because you have to freeze down, have to freeze through all that other ice. Free some more ice. To do it, yeah. yes. Hey, you knew Grandpa when he was going through all this, didn't you? All oh, these different very businesses well, and all. Very well. What was it like when he was going in and out of this business and that business and stuff like that? Oh, he was a, he was a, a, so social. He was just mixing with everybody. He had all his friends out on the road here. Yeah. And he also uh, got a hold of a fish company and went to the fish pit and sold the blue pike fish. He'd get. Uh, a big, huge, couple huge crates of them, fish like that, and we would clean them, or would uh, and ice them down the winter, take put them on this ice truck, yeah. and haul them around in the winter time when there wasn't much ice to deliver. And we'd sell fish. Well, what we was he? A lot of fish. Was he just a natural businessman that wanted yep. to buy and sell always, anything he could get his hand on? Always was into something. Always yeah. something. He had that great business. You know, <laughs> had, yeah. Well, you know, he had so many things that could have really hit. You know, the yeah. real estate, the oil, the cars. Yeah, all kind of things. All kind of things. You know? Cars, he was a salesman for a dealership. That's what he was. Yeah. But still, it sounds like he was a real salesman. He did. He did well while looking. But uh, when 29 came along, there was no money. Yeah. Nobody would buy one. What was yeah. it like growing up at St. Henry? Did you, did you guys, was it pretty much fun, or would you work all the time? Or I mean, oh, it sounds like it was fun. fun yeah. yeah. Matter of fact, it wasn't enough work. They put me on the farm when I was 12 years old, out in Minster, on the farm for one summer. Oh, boy, did I hate that. Did you stay the farm a whole summer? Stay the farm a whole summer. Where would you months. sleep, Dad? Never came home in three months. Oh, Lord. Never been away from home before. Sounds like me going to Brunnerdale. Oh, boy, yeah. It was bad, Not fun. Bad, bad, bad. Not fun. I was about the same age, too, though. Really? Well, you were gone for a whole year. I wasn't Who'd you stay with over there? Joe Kemper. I worked for Joe Kemper. He just died here about a year ago. about nine years old. No kid. What was he like to work for? Very nice. Yeah. Very you nice. have his family there and everything? Yeah. Yeah. He had two, two children, a boy and a girl. Yeah. Later, he wound up about seven. But at that time, he just had about What were you doing up here? Like Did Grandpa yeah. ever regret selling the farm? And not in, no. coming to town? Because of his back? He his back. His neck was broke. Yeah. And, and uh, Grandpa was sitting in a chair over here all about four or five years before he died. He had a uh, cold in his neck. You know how you get a uh, yeah. stiff neck and, oh, boy, he's hurting so bad. And right. Boy, he had this Dr. Miller over Van Wert. If he could just get over there, he could really take care of him. So it took him, finally he got him good enough. He got him over to Van Wert. And Dr. Miller says, well, first thing we got to do is we got to have an x-ray. See what we got here. See? Dr. Miller took that x-ray and he see that jumble of bones. Yeah. And it all healed every crooked old which way in there you can So I wouldn't touch that with a ten foot pole. He said, no way. He said, you might as well take it back home because I can't do a thing. He wasn't gonna do it anyway. Oh, no, Did Grandpa Fullen Camp ever talk about that experience? That breaking his neck? Not very much. But he was a very social person, no. I'll tell you. Grandpa. Okay. Yeah. Well, I remember when he was when he was very oh, very old. That's a good joke. You know, he's Heidi. Yeah. Like, yeah. Good laugh. Tremendous yeah. sense of humor. Oh, yeah. that's what I remember. Yeah. 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 I remember that very. Well, we're talking to Grandpa now, so let me talk a little bit longer, okay? We're talking about the Missouri stuff. Now, what did what did Grandpa Fully Camp do during World War II then? Because all the boys were gone. He had to hire a lot of extra help during that time. Whatever help he could pick up. Whatever help he could pick up. Now. You were gone, Tiny was gone. Health was very, very poor to that, too. Oh, really? That's a bad health, yeah. Why? Health. Why bad health? Oh, for whatever reasons, I can't tell you exactly. Because he, how old did Grandpa live to be? 88? 88. 88 years old. 89 in February. He died in November 1st. 88, 89. Well, now you, you were in the Army. Red was in the Army. Tiny was in the Navy. No, Tiny was in the Army. Tiny, all three years. He was in the Army Air Corps. Yeah. It's a different branch, I can't tell you. Yeah. But you were, were you the only one that went to Europe? Yeah. Yeah. The only one went overseas. Yeah, right now, excuse me, guys. The other two guys stayed right here, right? Uh, uh, 
Look down south of it. That was in Boca Raton, Florida, Key West. That area there. I know what I want you to tell me about. When you graduated from high school, you and a bunch of guys took a trip to Florida. Went to Florida. Herb Wolf and Dick Bernard. What year was that? Let's see. 38, 39. 38, 39? Yeah, 38, I was 21 years old. I'd say about that time. Yeah. yeah. And you guys, what, you took a car and you drove all the way down to Florida? 31 Chevy. 31 Chevy. 31 Chevy. How long did it take you to get there? It was a beautiful car. It was the first car that had a grill in front of the radiator. Where had the grill been? What? Where had the grill? It was just plain radiator stuck out there. Yeah, oh, oh, the oh. This had a little decorative in front of it, huh? Decorative in front of that radiator. That was quite fast stuff. How long did it take you to get the floor? It had a cloth uh, Cloth top. Not cloth. Uh, was not metal. It was. Uh, oh, I don't know. We went on for two weeks. We had uh, so Each one of us took $60. And we stayed at the motel there for three dollars a night. Yeah, yeah. Right the motel and just built there at uh, Boynton, Florida. Yeah. And we all came back with about three dollars a piece. Pretty close, huh? Yeah. Oh no, it was three dollars a piece. That's a lot of money. Where'd you go to Florida? Where in Florida? We went to uh, West Palm Beach. First yeah. we went to uh, oh, it's Savannah, Georgia, and then St. Augustine, yeah. West Palm Beach, yeah. and then the Boynton, which is southwest. Of Stayed there and then we went down to Miami and came back and we traveled out of Boynton to, up to West Palm Beach and yeah. then around from there. How populated was Florida back then? Uh, we thought quite a bit at that time, but it was nothing compared to today. Pretty open, huh? Well, it was 50 years ago, 38, 50 years ago. Good Lord. Yeah, whoa, it was nothing. Now that look, was a long trip for four, somebody back no then. No four lane highways. Yeah. No four lane highways at all. We had traffic lights everywhere. How many cars were there back then? Dalton, Georgia. Dalton, Georgia. A lot of cars. A lot of cars? Not like today. Not like we, today. We considered a lot then. Boy, well, compared to today, it didn't hold a camera. Yeah. Smidgen compared to today. How, you and how many guys went? Herb Wolf and Dick Bernard died. Herb Wolf, Dick Bernard. Now, where's Herb we Wolf? We always had a lot of bananas. Bananas were very cheap. For really people. cheap? You get a bunch of bananas. We eat bananas along the way. Yeah. And, our, and, and we stopped at the grocery store and buy crackers and bologna. We had our mustard beers all the time. And then our evening meal, we stopped at the restaurant. Yeah. Whatever that was. Yeah. Do, what'd you do when you were down there? A lot of swimming? Swimming? Like the beach a lot? Yeah. yeah. We met a few girls, you know. Yeah, well, that's what you got to do at that age, yeah, right? Yeah, with a few girls. They had a good time, so we. I remember you yeah. telling me about that. Yeah. Well, where are those two guys now? They're both in Living Florida now. Oh, really? Yeah. We're not passed away here by years ago. No kidding. Yeah. That had to be a, I can remember when Monty and I went to Arizona. Yeah. That was a good time. I remember that very oh, well. Yeah. Oh, I remember Remember that? Did you call those pictures in there? Yeah. What? I got them around here someplace. God, we took a few snapshots all we took to be able to the best was available at the time. Sure. Yeah. Ah, that's neat. I wanted to get that too.